Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator and Jim Good, and we are in the Rifles Berkshire and Wiltshire Museum in Salisbury, um, again, and we're talking more about body mechanics and this uh, supination and pronation thing, uh, which is new to me and I'm learning about, but also um, what I do know more about is John Musgrave Waite's treatise, um, which is one of the main um, treatises or manuals that we teach Sabre from in Scholar Gladiatoria. And um, I think one of the interesting points that I would just want to open with is that um, John Musgrave Waite's starting position, his, his on guard, his engaging guard position is not normal. So one of the things that uh, Waite makes a big point about is that he's trying to combine some of the qualities of foil fencing with sabre fencing and he criticizes the fact that lots of people who've taught sabre before or single stick um, only really look at cutting and only really look at they don't look enough at the use of the point and so he's actually not terribly clear on what how his system is different to what other people are teaching and i've kind of gradually been teasing out the threads of this and working out why why did he consider what he was teaching so different to what other people were teaching and i think one of the answers is if we look at the standard regulation manual of 1875 um, who's uh, which is anonymous but i now know who uh, who wrote that but i'll that will be featured in a future article that's my secret for now um, and and equally, if we look at um, Allenson Wynne's uh, Broadsword and Single Stick from 1890, and in that we can see that by, um, by the 1870s, and probably actually by the 1850s, the standard engaging guard or on guard position for single stick and for sabre in Britain was essentially this. Okay, with the blade going downwards down here. The blade being, uh, sorry, the point being held back slightly and the elbow being bent and you'll notice that my finger representing the blade because I'm not walking around with a sword I don't always have a sword with me um, it is dividing my torso in half diagonally okay and you'll notice that my body is kind of 45 degrees onto the target now where weight's different is first of all weight turns the body completely sideways onto the target and he straightens the arm out Okay, so what Waite's doing is he's making himself a more narrow target, he's stretching the arm out and he's lifting that point up. So he's essentially using the standard British engaging guard, but narrower, straighter. Right. I find that slightly painful actually, to stand it is, like it that. Literally, it should, should be painful. Yeah. You're actually creating that stretch. Yeah. Even if you... It, it hurts my back. So, <laughs> so often when I'm fencing, I'll try and start in weights engaging guard like this. And you'll notice my, my stomach kind of comes out. And in the images of weight when he's standing, he, I mean, he was probably a more portly guy than me, although right. I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, but he, he does seem to be puffing out the center of his body like this when he's standing in the images. But I find that whilst I start fencing like this, I find it very tiring and I gravitate back to that. I right. gravitate to the more comfortable position that we see in the, um, yeah, in the earlier uh, and contemporary mainstream um, uh, British sabre sources. Um, and uh, these engaging guards, incidentally, for a long time were overlooked. Most people fence from terse, okay, because terse is what's shown in, uh, terse or medium rather. Medium is shown in Hutton's uh, Cold Steel. And in fact, in Hutton's earlier works, he's in terse. And in his earliest works, he's actually in the standard British engaging guard. So we know that in the 1860s, Hutton was doing this. In the 80s, he switched to this. And towards the end of the 1880s and into the 1890s, he switched to this. Uh, Burton seems to be predominantly from Terse. And most people find Terse the least fatiguing, the most comfortable right. guard to stand in for Sabre. But in Britain, for Cutlass and for Sabre, it's very clear that the standard engaging guard was actually more like this. That's got some relations, hasn't it, to this supination and pronation yeah, stuff? I think when you, get a, when you have that guard, you get this great free hit because you're basically pulling the weight down and you really don't have to do anything too complicated to get that first really good strike. I think mm. it mentions, somebody mentions that somewhere. Mm. I should take better notes when I read these things. <laughs> <laughs> but from here, it's a little trickier because 
Yeah, I think it's almost know. it's it's related yeah, to the elbow, I think. So yeah. for me, anyway, from if I if I'm standing in my more comfortable version of it, right. when I do a cut, as well as as well as the sword going in a circle round here, right. my elbow. If you look at my elbow, goes from up to down okay so actually although the elbow isn't really moving backwards and forwards very much it might move forwards a little bit i'm also dropping the elbow in so it means that i'm going from my uh, right angle pointing upwards here to right angle pointing more downwards to there so it's essentially moving from a hand in uh, pronation is that right yeah pronation. to a hand in whoops in supination okay and also you'll notice this rear shoulder comes back so there's quite a lot of energy and force that comes yeah. from a relatively small amount of movement and of course my hand you'll notice and the sword moves through 180 degrees okay you can see hand down there to there so 180 degrees so with a moulinet, in other words, a small circle of the blade, you're getting quite a lot of motion oh, in. Right. Now, the other thing which seems particular about weight is that uh, if we look at uh, Hutton or Burton, for example, we see moulinet, circular motions, made with varying degrees of use of the elbow and mostly use of the wrist. If we look at Italian systems, it might entirely come from the elbow. Mm. But if we look at British systems, it mostly seems to come from the wrist and the little bit of the elbow. We see these moulinets or circular motions made a very big deal of. But weight's a bit different, isn't he? Because he seems to make direct cuts. Well, uh, direct, he, you're not drawing, he says you don't want to draw back the point or the wrist. So mm. you never want to do, you know, that. Mm. But you can still, you know, if you put a line here, I can still do that supination pronation thing where I draw it back a little bit, but never quite cross that threshold of it coming back. Mm. And that lets you have that guard covering your whole arm for the whole time. I don't think it's as powerful. If you do a moulinet and combine no. the two, then it's, yeah. you know, it's more power. But if you don't care, if you're not trying to kill the person as aggressively, or you just if it's a, if it's a very defensive hit them situation. hard enough to put hard them hard enough, yeah, or just hors de combat, hors de combat, as they or, is it, or, or out of action, yeah. As, it, yeah, as we would say in English. So it's, um, <laughs> there's really it's it's hard to do that with just the wrist. Yeah, you know, just the local muscles of the wrist. So if you're actually able to connect the arm to your back muscles, you know, like you would do with a longbow, mm -hmm. then you can do a fair bit of stuff with satisfying his requirement of not, or the point not coming back past mm. the wrist, of the wrist not coming back, of the elbow, because that becomes a target. And it's very clear to me that, again, this is a specific feature of weight. Incidentally, if you've never read weight or you're interested in learning more about weight, the link will be below this video to, to the treatise, which is on our own website. Um, uh, we scanned it and put it on there. I'm lucky enough that there are three members of my club which have original copies of weight now. So, but when I started studying military sabre, you couldn't get weight online. Right. Um, and um, I, I had a hunch from everything I'd read about weight that it would be a very interesting so uh, source to delve into. And it turns out it is very interesting for two main reasons. One, he's got a very detailed system of, uh, of swordsmanship particularly looking at attacks and the use of the feint. Far more than any other um, uh, English language sabre source I'm aware of. And secondly, because he has a section on the cutting feats. Oh, he, 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 yeah, and, and the cutting feats are fascinating. But additionally, he also has a very, very good section. The, again, the most comprehensive I know of in any manual of sword versus bayonet. And one thing that uh, people looking at military sabre sources often uh, forget or overlook um, is the fact that, of course, or in war, the most likely, if you're someone using a sword, a sabre, i.e. you're an officer or an inf uh, a cavalryman fighting on foot for some reason, the most likely opponent you're going to come up against in hand-to-hand -hand combat is someone using a bayonet, not someone using another sword. Uh, so we spend all this time training sword against sword, but actually we should spend a lot more time training sword against bayonet. And weight has an absolutely fantastic, as I say, the biggest um, sword versus bayonet uh, corpus that I'm aware of. Um, he has a really, really good section on it. Anyway, I'll stop singing the praises of weight. <laughs> as I say, that his his on guard position is quite fatiguing, quite um, quite um, particular. He obviously had a very particular idea and theory behind why it was held like that. It is not for everybody, I would say. It's very, very tiring. And uh, as I say, I still revert back to the more typical version. And I still revert back to terse quite often as well when I get tired. Um, but um, in terms of cutting and this idea of direct cutting, um, 
as Jim says that he makes a very specific point about from his engaging guard not bringing the point Point really back back, okay and not bringing the hand back now if we're in his engaging guard here and I'm going to hit you the viewer okay or the camera in this case (laughs) if I'm going to hit the camera then I've got to lunge with my foot at the same time as making the cut. And we want the foot to land at the same time as the cut. But additionally, my sword is going to move through 180 degrees, but without my point moving back and without my hand moving back. So whilst it might might feel most natural for a person to do this, or even to move their whole arm, Okay, and certainly that would be the most powerful option. What weight seems to want us to do is instead this. Okay, mm. so it's he's literally just turning the hand round the wrist, and I guess he must revolve the elbow, but he's not mm. bending it. Um, he's turning it from pronation to supination, exactly. isn't he? Yeah, so yeah. this is where it ties into the, the work that Jim's. Well, he's also explicitly talks about um, you know he, to. Oh, what was that? As he said, to give more impetus to the cut, he mm. talks about having to sink with the left haunch mm. a little bit, and that's sort of creating a line. You're actually pulling it, the supination from that part of your leg. So you're actually creating yeah. a line from your hand to your foot, mm. and using your back muscles. So that's why. What I would one point I would make about weights is he might have he might be the only person who really explicitly talks about keeping everything forward. But to actually fulfill those requirements, you have to use the extension motions or the mechanics that I think are being used. So weight doesn't show the extension motions, but um, Jim makes a very good case for the fact that the extension motions may be very beneficial to weight system uh, and explain some of it and maybe help you to make to make you better at it i think weight's just assumed everyone already knew the stuff well it could be and you know weight was a career soldier um until he became a full-time fencing teacher and he joined in the 1840s i seem to recall around 1840 and served until about 1865 at which right. point he retired he got the medal for long service and good conduct he briefly became a yeoman of the guard at the tower of london <laughs> for about a year i think and then he became a full-time fencing instructor um so so, so yeah, he had clearly been in the army, and not only the army, but the second lifeguards. Okay, one of the most elite, one of the most elite cavalry regiments in the British Empire. Um, he had been, a, and a sergeant major as well. And you know, sergeant majors were very often involved with teaching, right. with, with drill instructing. So he had been in the, one of the most elite cavalry regiments in the, in the world at the time and undoubtedly been involved in training the men. And so he would have looked at, and we know that he studied foil under Pierre Provost, who was one of the best uh, Parisian foil teachers of the time. So he studied the top art of uh, of foil. He undoubtedly trained soldiers in in the elite um, cavalry. And additionally, he gave demonstrations of swordsmanship uh, all around Britain. Yeah, Yeah. sword feats and fencing as well. And he fenced with bayonet, sabre, single stick and foil in numerous competitions against the best people of the day. So he clearly knew what he was talking about. He never went to war, um, but in terms of martial arts practice, Mm. he had it all. He ticks all the boxes, a very interesting guy. Um, And um, yeah, so so I think there's a lot there to, I think there's a lot there to study. Mm. One final point I'd just like to pick up on is he makes a point about pace versus Weight, I think, doesn't he? Heaviness. Weight as in, yeah, Yeah. as in mass. Um, So, uh, and this comes back to the point about striking direct in a direct line rather than making a big circle. Okay, so he's not bringing the point back at all and he's not bringing the hand back at all. He's just striking like that. And so it seems that weight is very much about laying the blade on Mm. in the most direct way possible and that would reinforce the fact that he's trying to bring foil Mm. ethos methodology into the use of the saber Um, and you know like you say it's not the most powerful cut but maybe it's a cut that's effective enough that you can then combine it with yeah then dispatch the person uh, in in whatever way Um, so yeah so very very interesting stuff um, and I think we're going to wrap it up there. But uh, again, link to Waits' uh, manual below. And um, 
we'll definitely be continue talking about this. So this whole thing with the um, uh, extension motions. I always forget how, how they're probably called. The extension yeah. motions and pronation and supination. I'm going to be doing lots more and thinking so about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. There's too many new terms for me to remember. Um, but we're, I'm definitely going to be uh, trying to, you know, learn a bit more about this and put some more thinking. And I think I'm myself going to go back to Waits manual and read it again with a fresh pair of eyes um, because I certainly know more about the other sources now and I think Waite is not showing what's normal he's showing a particular system of his own devising and I think I'm now starting to get a better idea of what he was trying to explain that was different to the other stuff around anyway thanks a lot Jim for joining thanks, me man. here and uh, yeah see you guys soon Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.